Hello, everyone, and welcome. It's my absolute pleasure to introduce Jack Ma, Executive Chairman of the Alibaba Group. Jack founded Alibaba in his apartment in China in 1999 with a group of 18 co-founders. He was one of the first people in China to really understand the potential of the internet and has utilized it to help small businesses succeed in a global marketplace. Today, the Alibaba Group is the largest retail and mobile commerce company in the world, with more than half a billion consumers shopping on its marketplaces and tens of millions of businesses selling their products. The company has directly and indirectly employed more than or created more than 30 million jobs. And Jack says the company is just getting started. He has ambitions of creating 100 million jobs and reaching 2 billion people. Jack also has a long history with the World Economic Forum. He first came to Davos in 2001 as a young global leader. He sits on the board of the World Economic Forum, and he recently joined the board of Global Shapers. We are so lucky to have Jack with us here today. Thank you so much for making time for the young communities within Davos. And can I please ask everyone to join me in giving Jack a very warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you. We have global shapers, young global leaders, and technology pioneers in the room who are all really looking forward to asking some questions. So I'll just kick off with a few first. Please. So you ended your interview last year by saying we really need to pay attention to people who are 30 years old, to the next 30 years, and to companies that have less than 30 employees. I turned 30 last year, so it was particularly oh. welcome to hear this. And I think for many people in the room, they meet one or two of those categories. So in light of that, what are you most looking forward to and most scared of in the next 30 years? Yeah, we people are very lucky because we are in the uh, area that the world is in a very big transformation because of the te technology. Uh, I think we read a lot of, on the books that uh, 200 years ago when the first industry had a lot of great people, and then 100 years ago, electricity revolution came, a lot of success people. So now the technology come. This new technology will also create a lot of successful people, interesting careers. But honestly, every technology revolution come is going to create a lot of social problems. And uh, my view is the first technology revolution caused the first world war. Second technology revolution caused the second world war. Now we are in the third. So what, what is going to happen? People worry about artificial intelligence. People worry about robots. People worry about a computer and data and privacy and securities. People start to worry. <laughs> but whether you worry, it will come. You don't worry, it comes. So the thing is how you change yourself. So I, I think next 30 years, the world is going to be huge change. If there is a third world war, I think the world war should be a war against the disease, a war against environment pollution, right? a war against the poverty together. We should not a war against ourselves. But if we do not see clearly that using the new te technology to solve this problem, if we do not unite, align together, we, human beings are going to fight each other. Because every technology revolution will make the world unbalanced. When something unbalanced coming, Somebody used to be number one, suddenly become number two, and somebody was number three, and then become number one. It's all about comfortable. So we people, if you are 30 years old, my, my view is that if, when you are 20 to 30 years old, you should follow a good boss, join a good company to learn how to do things properly. When you're 30 to 40 years old, if you want to do something yourself, just do it. You still can't afford to lose, to fail. But when you're 40 to 50 years old, my suggestion is that you should do things that you are good at, right? And not do things that, oh, that's very interesting. I want to try something new. It's a bit dangerous more. When you're 50 to 60 years old, spending time training and developing young people, the next generation. When you're over 60 years old, better stay with your grandchildren. <laughs> but this is normally general 
like that. Not everybody were like that, but most of the people were like that. So 30 years old, we people next to 30 years are the luckiest period. We have a lot of challenges, a lot of things are happening, and with our knowledge, with our physical power, it's time you need to change. You have to think. We all, if you want to be successful tomorrow, it's impossible. If you want to be successful a year later, it's impossible. But if you want to win 10 years later, you have chance. That is what I think. Wonderful. And moving on to a topic which is kind of impossible to ignore after 2017. So a third of all the people in leadership positions in Alibaba are women. But the picture elsewhere is, is a bit more bleak. And a friend of mine recently said something that has really stayed with me. Women are tired of empowerment programs, and we want power. In 2016, venture capitalists invested $58.2 billion in male-founded companies, while women received just $1.46 billion. And as 2017 showed, it was a year of sexual harassment scandals, the gender pay gap still exists, and unfortunately, the list does go on. So how do you think we can move beyond tokenistic gestures towards genuine gender equality? Yeah, that is very interesting. A uh, few years, uh, like four years ago, there is a journalist uh, came to our company. And when he leaves, he asked me a question, why there are so many women in your company? <laughs> and I never realized we have so many women in our company. I said, anything wrong? Today, we have a 49%, close 49% of the employees of our company are women. That's a lot for a high-tech company. It's not on purpose we hire women. We think they are great in helping us to grow. Alibaba is an e-commerce company. E-commerce is a service industry. To serve people better, you, have a, you should have a serve, service heart. We find that women doing much better jobs than men. And the second is the last century, people compete because of muscle. No, not, this century is not muscle, it's the wisdom. And next is, I, I believe, if a person wants to be successful, you should have a high EQ. But if you don't want to lose quickly, you should have a high IQ. But if you want to be respected, you should have, have high LQ, the Q of love. So those three Qs put together, a lot of men, they have a high IQ, but low EQ, a very tiny LQ. <laughs> Women, balance-wise, they're the best. If you want your company to be successful, if you want your company to operate with wisdom, with care, women is the best. In my company, we notice that women, they care <coughs> others much more than men. Even on our site, today on shopping site, e-commerce, we find women buy a lot of things. But they buy for their husband, their parents, their kids. Men only buy for themselves, mostly. Because you care, that makes you the difference. So. We have a 49% of the, uh, the colleagues in the company are women, and close 37% of the senior management are women. We never feel anything wrong, and women, they, they, they sacrifice more. They, when they, they love it, they believe it, they continue to do it. So I think the very, one of the secret sources for Alibaba to be successful was successful in the past 18 years because we have so many women colleagues. And the other thing is that we feel so proud. And you know, most of the time you see I go out, I never realized that when we count always 50% of women with my delegation, my team, because we never think they're women. We think they're great colleagues. So if you try to say, now we got too many men, so we have to put some women inside, uh, that's a disaster for both sides. So what would your advice be to companies that operate a little bit more on that quota-based system but seem to be not making progress or not having such kind of representation? When you have a quota-based, you, you must have a lot of women. You will never reach that. I think 
a, if a company full of men trust me, this company cannot be sustainable, cannot keep on growing. Because just like a, a stew, if you don't put water inside, this stew is too tough. It's easy to break. So when you have a woman and a man in, in the same company, when something happens, the women are the, for, for example, one of the value for our company is that the number one value is customer number one, employee number two, shareholder number three. This is everywhere I go. Wall Street did not like my point, but this is what <laughs> I said. You know, if you if you if you like us, invest in us. If you don't like us, please sell our stocks. Don't buy us. <laughs> we believe customer number one, employee number two, shareholder number three. But when men start, when we start to compete, men suddenly get very angry, and you know they start, and women always come and say, la, 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 la. "No competition. Let's think about customer number one." Most of the women, they believe in the first day dream or first day love. Most of the men easy to forget. I'm sorry, it's the, not I say bad about men. This is statistic. <laughs> this is statistic. This is why our company work the balance. And it's, it's naturally happening. It's not like we, uh, so a lot of people have a tendency, man is better in doing things. But we don't, we think that even if man is better, we still have to hide the woman inside. And then the women have enough women, women will hide people more. So this is how we did it. So, uh, I don't know how many high-tech companies in the world like us, 49% colleagues are women. We feel proud of that. As you should be, and I think it's a very strong message to send out to, like I say, other companies that have a range of reasons for why that's, why that's not the case, because clearly you've been able to build the yeah. most successful one with, with, that being, with that being so. So you just came off stage after giving a talk about digital e-commerce and what needs to happen for small businesses and entrepreneurs to benefit from globalization. At a time when globalization, once again, is being questioned, is it really delivering for the most vulnerable? Is it delivering for people in the global south, et cetera? So what is your message to people in this room kind of about globalization, really? I think globalization cannot be stopped. Nobody can stop globalization. Nobody can stop trade. And I believe if trade stops, war starts. Trade is the way to solve the, to, to, to dissolve the war, not to cause the wars. I think globalization did a fantastic job in the past 30 years, enriched a lot of countries, but of course caused a lot of problems, right? Young people did not have opportunities. Small business have not opportunities. Develop, developing countries were neglected, but it's only 30 years. It's a baby. It's a grow. You have to improve it. If you do not improve it, then you kill it. It's easy. Most of the time, to kill something is much easy. So my belief is it's our generation's job. Today, we have a better technology. We have a better knowledge about globalization. And it's our generation's responsibility <laughs> or opportunity to improve it. Tell me, how can you stop globalization? Now, artificial intelligence come, robots come. My grandfather worked 16 hours a day, and he said he's, he was very busy. We work eight hours a day. We said, we are very busy. <laughs> Our children may only work three hours or four hours a day, for three days a week. I bet they will say, oh, we're very busy. <laughs> <laughs> then when you work only three hours a day and four days a week, what are you going to do? You're going to travel around. Right? You cannot stay in the home for a, for a week. <laughs> you will travel. Uh, 30 years ago, normal life, you visit 20 to 30 cities whole your life. 30 years later, in your life, you will visit 300 cities in your life because of mobile. How can you stop it? It's impossible. So thinking about that, the only thing is to improve it, to make it simple. Global trade should be simple, should be modernized, should be giving inclusive. Everybody have the opportunity. 
So my strong message is that, well, I feel sorry for WTO. They did a great job, but uh, in the past 20 years, when you put the 200 government ministers in a one room, how can they agree on something? <laughs> right? Because I don't like your country. No matter how good suggestion you have, I say no. <laughs> But business people, even if we put 200 business people in the one room, we will surely agree on something. And this is what I believe. The next generation of globalization should be inclusive, should create opportunities for young people to get involved. The first globalization in the human history was controlled by few kings and emperors. Na last 30 years, globalization was controlled by 60,000 big companies. If you're not among the big companies, if you're not in the big, co powerful countries, you don't have a chance. The next 30 years, I bet, we will, be, we will have 6 million or 16 million or 60 million companies get involved in globalization. And I, I'm sure. We will make it happen together with a lot of people, maybe with you. With a mobile phone, if people still use the mobile phone 30 years later. With a mobile phone, you can global buy. You want to buy something from Kenya, you just click. You want to buy something from Norway, you click. Global buy, global sell. If you're a small thing, without internet, you can only sell in your village or small town. Today, you can sell across the world and global pay, global delivery, and global travel, the only thing you have to bring is a mobile phone, no, not even a passport. This is going to happen in 10 years. And this is the message. Let's catch this opportunity. If you complain, the other people catch it. If you catch the opportunity, embrace it now, you will be the next Alibaba. People like me, I was born in a very poor family. I never got a great education. You know, I, I failed all the examinations. For what reason? I don't know. But later, I realized I don't have money. I don't have technology. I don't have a lot of good backgrounds. We, we have a rich uncle or something. No. <laughs> the only thing I competed with my people, the young people, is let's compete for 10 years later. This is what I believe 10 years later will be happening. So everything I do for that goal, I know 10 years later, this thing is going to happen. So prepare for that. Because I know if I compete with him for next month, no chance. So this is how my message. It's, up, it's a challenge, but it's an opportunity. And it's the opportunity for people like us. This world, the most difficult thing is to convincing a successful people. Ah, we tell him. This is a great opportunity. He said, no, 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 no. Forget it, right? I've been doing this for 30 years. But for people like us, we're looking for opportunities in order to survive. So we will do anything to be creative. So this is the message. 30 years, it's opportunity for us. It's a challenge for those people who are 60 years old. If they're 60 years old, <laughs> And not, not discrimination, but it's, <laughs> it is tough for them. And maybe says something about how we need to look at government as well in terms of more young people entering and doing policy making. So if there are these six or 16 or 60 million businesses and we're all kind of hyper-connected, on a more fundamental level, do you think consumption is making us happy? Consumption? What do you mean consumption by making us happy? Oh. But through, through consuming, are we becoming happier through being more connected? Is that genuinely? Yeah, of course, connection? consumption will make, uh, the, without consumption, definitely we're not happy, right? But if their consumption may not be, the thing is that for me, people like me, uh, people say, oh, Jack, you are very rich, you know, but I don't have time to spend money. <laughs> and I know this money is, that does not belong to me. When I have a one million, two million, it's my money. But when you have uh, 20 million, problem comes, you think the US dollars is to value or English pound, and the stock market is going to problem. When you're over $1 billion, <laughs> that is the responsibility, because the society trusts you, Kim. 
manage the money better. If you think that is your money, you'll get into trouble. This is what I always believe. That's the. How can a person have a, you know, twenty or, or I mean, two billion dollars? No matter how hard you, how hard you work, you should not get to two billion or twenty billion. The money people put on you is the trust and credit you have. So you should spend money better than government. You should spend money better than the other people. Uh, spend money on the right places. So, consumptions, yes. And I can service industry. Let me tell you one thing. The AI robots is going to kill a lot of jobs. Because in the future, machine. But there will be, we have to create modern service industry. Service industry is going to help. Service is got a lot about consumptions. So doing the cons consumptions, service industry has huge hope. But you have to do uniquely. I think from that slightly philosophical point, we can turn to the floor for questions. So if you, <laughs> if you could please introduce yourself, say where you're from, please keep your questions succinct so we can take as many as possible and relevant for the whole group. Great. So would you like to go first? Hi, my name is Parv. I'm a global shaper from Chicago. And you just talked about philanthropy, and I'm curious if you could talk about how you see your role as changing in, in the giving space, particularly given the fractured world we live in. Yeah, I think philanthropy uh, uh, the, is not about helping others. It's about helping yourself. Um, I had a huge debate with my colleagues. Several years ago, there was a big earthquake in China. And there was a big earthquake in Japan. So I do, we, we donated uh, like a, uh, I forgot their exam, like $20,000 to Japan, $10,000, $15 to China. And people say, why we donate that little? Because we are, you know, we have a lot of money. And my point is, no matter how much money you donate, $2 million, $20 million? That money compared to that is tiny. You cannot change a lot of things there. The thing you donate because you change yourself. When you change, the world is changed. You have to change yourself, right? And the next thing is that philanthropy is about action. It's about involvement. It's not about giving money. It's about wake up people's consciousness. So I think. To me, I grow up, and my globalization is grew up in this place. Two th year 2001, when I was nominated as a young global leader, I had a no idea what is Davos, where is, the, is it, and what, what is about a young global leader. But I came here, I learned, I listened about these corporate cit global citizenship and <laughs> globalization and all things. I grow up. I understand. It's, this is, to me, it's like a philanthropy. And this has changed to me, as I told Schwab, that every time I come to Davos, I want to spend time with young people. Because I benefit from global, young global leaders, early days. When I listen to Bill Gates, and Bill Clinton, and George Soros, these guys. At that time, we don't have that many people. Very poor facilities. We are very cold. I work like you know, 30 minutes driving in a, in a bus coming here and watching. But now, I think you still have, but this is good. You know, this is, this is, a, this is, the, this is the, the tuition we pay for a grown up. And now, to me, I think spending time with you benefit me, and also I want to tell you my true experience. It's a philanthropy. It does not necessarily mean it's money. So by charity, you cannot change the world. But if you have a philanthropy heart, you can do a lot of things. So I find this one, unfortunately, a lot of people have a business heart here, making money, mm -hmm. but do things like a philanthropy. What we should do is should be a philanthropy heart, but have a business skill. I hate a lot of people do the opposite. Uh, they want to make money, but they talk like a philanthropy. And they do like a philanthropy, waste a lot of money. So 
this is what I mean. And it's uh, if you want your team to continue to work with you all your life, you have to plant the seed of care the world, care others. The first day they join, I don't like a lot of companies make a lot of money because making pollutions and counterfeit products by end of the year donate some money. This is no good. Business, the philanthropy idea should, should be buried into the business model. That's, yeah. Philan <laughs> <laughs> philanthropy of heart, I think, yeah. the message that young people can take forward, please. Hi, my name is Iman. I'm a global shaper from the Jeddah Hub in Saudi Arabia. My question is, as a young boy, did you envision that your life would be like this? Did you have intuition about this? And if so, do you think the belief uh, helped in achieving such great success? Uh, as a young boy, I never thought, you know, as a young boy, even today, I never thought I would be here. <laughs> Honestly, I never thought. But as a young boy, I prob when I look back, uh, every problems I met in my, when I was a kid, benefited me. I failed so many times. People probably know that I've, I've applied jobs for so many jobs, over 30 jobs, all rejected, not even got a chance. 24 of us interviewed for a KFC job. 23 accepted. I was the only guy rejected. <laughs> five, six people went for uh, looking for a police job. Five accepted. I was the only one. My cousin and I applied job as a, as, as a, as a servant in a four-star hotel in my city. We waited a long queue for two hours. He was accepted. I was rejected. <laughs> so my mother looked at me, oh. <laughs> you know, because, but I know this is a training course for me. Before th my 30 years old, I'm a failure. Uh, people lose, but I never give up. I think there is an opportunity there. And then I, I was a teacher later. I graduated from university. I was a teacher in the university for six years. Number five, because number five year, I was elected the best teacher of my university, elected by students. So I said, everything I taught my students are the things I learn from books. What if I go out, spend 10 years, experience all the things, whether fail or succeed, I go back to teach again. That was my original thinking doing Alibaba. So I never thought I could be rich. I never thought I would be successful. I never thought we could survive for 18 years. And then we made it. The only thing that today we should do is share the experience and know-how, especially share the mistakes, suffers with others. My thinking is that, you guys remember, if you want to be successful, learn from the other people's mistakes. Don't learn from the successful stories. Successful stories they make, <laughs> don't listen to that. There are a lot of reasons behind it. Just like um, I remember the first time Harvard Business School came to us, say, Jack, we want to write a case study for you. Yes, years 2001, uh, 2000. They came, they spent one week, and they write a report, and I read, no, no, I said, this is not me. <laughs> and they said, this is you. I said, no, this is not us. He said, this is you. <laughs> so they make up his sign, and the case study go up, and they start to teach in a lot of universities. The next five years, they invited me to go to the case study. And they always find a competitor of my company. And F, after every case, stu case study, Alibaba will die. That company will succeed. All the students agree. And actually, every five years, all the competitors die. We still survive. <laughs> so how can you study this kind of a successful story? <laughs> Learn from the mistakes, the other people, no matter how smart you are you will encounter these mistakes. You learn from mistakes not because you will be able to avoid mistakes. You will able to, when these mistakes come, this suffer comes, you know how to deal with it, how to face it. I, I, the book I want to write, if I 
if I want, if I can. It's Alibaba 1001 mistakes. <laughs> this is the most treasurable things that in my life. In my life, it's not how much we achieved. It's how much we gone through the tough days and mistakes. And this is what, you, if you start to think now, it would be good. So if you ask me when I was a boy, I never felt about that. Never. I Let's go to person. the back of the room. Uh, Fan Lin, uh, Wai Jiao from Shanghai. Uh, I know that uh, you recently uh, spent uh, 100, million, uh, 100 billion RMB in deep tech research. I just wonder how you think of the future of deep tech and how that's going to influence humanity and creativity. Yeah. Thank you. I think technology, as a company, we invest 100 uh, billion RMB, which is like 150, right, uh, or 15. Yeah, 15 billion, 15 billion US dollars on researching for the high tech. Um, as a company, I hope in the future we gain our profit because of our technology, not because of our size. So we have to invest in technology. But I don't like this kind of, there's a debate. Artificial intelligence, big data is going to threat the human beings. I think. Artificial intelligence should support human beings. The technology should always doing something to enable people instead of to disable people. When steam machine comes, when car comes, people hate it. You know, today we think car is good. When the, man, the, 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 the automobile when first was designed, people hate, especially this car, this horseman. <laughs> Right, they destroy every car they can see. So I would say, people like us, when we have the money, we have the resources, we have the young, all the excellent young people, we should spend money on the technology that enable people, empower people, make life better. So this is what we want to invest. And I think artificial intelligence, no matter how artificial intelligence is good, Human being in the future compete with the machine on knowledge. You don't have chance. Computer is always going to be smarter than you are. When there's a car, forget about it, who runs faster. When there's a plane, don't think you can fly. Like a, when there's a computer, you know, computer is always smarter than you are. They never f forget. They remember everything. They never get angry. They calculate faster. But computer can never be as wise as a man. What's the difference between smart and wisdom? My view is a smart people see something the other people don't see. A wise people see something he pretend he did not see it. A smart people know what he want. A wise people know what he doesn't want. A wisdom. Person with wisdom knows I don't. Only you know I don't want this. Then you know what do you want. So I think this is the money we invest to support human beings, not supporting Alibaba. This lab is open to the whole world. It's not supporting Alibaba at all. Yeah. Wonderful. So I, uh, hi, I'm Saad, Global Shaper from the Islamabad Hub. I really want to know what you think about leadership. Uh, is it something that comes from the heart when it comes to decision making as a leader, or is it something that uh, that you have to take, uh, you have to think through your mind as well, or is it a bit of both? Like as a leader, when you make decisions, would you go with something that you really feel about from your heart, or would you have try to have a mix of your mind and your heart when you make decisions? Yeah, I think you are. Uh it's a good question. I've been thinking about that. First, it's, a, it's your nature instinct. There must be have something that you different. Second is you, you need the training. You should be trained through all the tough experience, but still positive. I found out some great leaders in the world. They are always positive. They never complain others. 
and never complain. And uh, they, they look at the things in a different view, like normal people. So I think people in my company, they, at the beginning, they don't like me because I'll always think about 10 years, five years. And then after we're working together for three or five years, they find, hmm, you're right. Then we got the credit rating. And as a CEO, one of the jobs, where everybody's happy, you have to see the unhappy things. When everybody's unhappy, you have to see the happy things. So leadership is nature, but you have to have a train and learn. And I got my leadership sub upgraded in doubles. I see so many. Well, I, you know, Ali Enter Financing, how many people here know about Alipay? Thank you. Alipay's decision was made here. I was thinking about Alipay, you know, but I was not able there to launch Alipay because in China, if you do financing without license, you will be in jail at that time. So I said, I went to the banks, can you help us do the e-commerce on transaction? No, 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 no. No banks would accept it. So if there will be no Alipay, no financing, the e-commerce would go nowhere. So I was, year 2004, I was here. Listen to a uh, speech by two state leaders about leadership. And this guy said, leadership is about responsibility. You believe it. But don't be, the people don't believe it. But if you think it's so critical, you should pay any price to do it. So that day changed my mind, and I called back to my uh, team and said, let's launch it within one month. If somebody has to go to the jail, I go to the jail. Who will be the second one follow me? If I go, you continue. <laughs> and you go to the jail, you go continue. That was the, called the leadership determination. And year 2004, I made a decision here. I called back. And now today, the Alipay launched. And it's so big, over you know, 800 million people today using Alipay globally. And this is called, yeah. Wonderful. Shall we take one from uh, YGL, to be, to be fair? Any questions? Yeah, please. Hello, my name is Pablo from Costa Rica, YGL. And Given your perspective of caring and being a trustee of all this, what do you do for self-care and also maybe within your company? Because earlier on, often you can cut through sleep or other things in a silly way, and you realize that if you plan for the long term, one also has to take personal care, be there mindfulness or prioritizing better. And how are you doing this, and how do you promote that in your company? Well. I'm lucky that I have 18 co-founders, <laughs> and most of them my students. When we, in my apartment, I told them my dream, I made my mission, and we videotape. Funny thing is that when Alibaba launched the, for the first day, I said, let's videotape everything, every important meetings that we joined together. I, the purpose is that someday, if we fail, we give the videos to the people to research why we fail. If we succeed, give the videos to the other people. So we have a, like, almost a whole house of videotapes. So the first videotape, I, say, I speak for two hours, and those guys look at me. <laughs> OK, so that's what you want to do? I say, yeah, this is what I want to do. Um, we, I was the first, I know nothing about technology. I know that nothing about management. I know nothing about, but the only thing is that you don't have to know a lot of things. You have to find the people who are smart than you are. My first way is always find people who knowledge on computer smart than I am. Accounting, smart than. For so many years, I always try to find the people who are smart than I am. And when you find so many smart people, my job is to making sure the smart people can work it together. And then if smart people can work it together, it's easier. The vision they will believe. Because if stupid people can work it together easily, 
Smart people can never work together. <laughs> but stupid people work together easily. They don't believe the vision. The people who believe the vision, but they don't work together. So very important is finding smart people. And my job is two things, making sure they work together. So the culture is important. Long term, you should be ideal with great, strong vision leader, but you should also have to survive today. If you don't survive today, you're gone. So <coughs> the best way to promote your company is not the you. It's not me as the CEO. The best way is your product, your services, your employees. The best, impro best product of your company is your employee. So I spent a lot of time, early days, for the first 2,000 employees of Alibaba, I speak everybody for, for one or two hours when they're joining. I said, I will never promise you will be rich. I never promise you will be promoted. But I promise you'll suffer. <laughs> I promise you will have a terrible life. And, right? and all, the, all the terrible things I promise when join this company. Right? But good things, if you promise good things, you are misleading them because I cannot promise myself. We, we know this is the future, but we, not, we are not sure that we will be there. But if we don't work together, we all will lose our job. So that's the thing. And they do always say, and I think I've experienced this myself, if you knew how hard it would be, would you, would you do it? And it seems for you a key part of leadership is leaving the ego at the door and being willing to hire people better than you who you can then kind of empower to carry out your, your vision. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Hi, I'm Iman uh, from Global Shaper Shakara Hub. Um, how does your experience of being a teacher influence how you run the business today? And do you have any message for those who are working in education uh, space? Thank you. How, the ex how, how does your experience of being a teacher in early days oh. influence how you run the business today? Oh. Yeah. Let me tell you one thing. I never thought I could be a CEO. I never thought I, later I'd become a good CEO. One of the things I learned is from teachers. As a teacher, very important the character of a teacher is the teacher always expects his students better. I want this student to become a banker, that student to become a mayor, that guy is a scientist. This is all teachers want. If you don't have this kind of thinking, it's a, it's a, it's a lousy, it's, it's a terrible teacher. A good teacher always wants the other people better. You don't want this teacher in jail, that teacher is a bankrupt, that teacher is, you know. <laughs> you know? So as a CEO, I trained myself is I always want those people who join the company do better than they thought. And everything the company should do is making sure the good environment to train him to be more positive. And everything we do, this is a teacher. And teacher does not mean I know better than you are. Everything I know better than you are because I learn from others. So a teacher should learn all the time. A teacher should share all the time. A teacher should always expect the other people better than you are. And by the way, education, it's a good, ch big challenge now. If we do not change the way we teach, 30 years later, we'll be in trouble. Because the way we teach, the, the thing we talk, teach our kids, are the things that the past 200 years is knowledge-based. And we cannot teach our kids to compete with machine who is smarter. We have to teach something unique. That is, machine can never catch up with us. In this way, 30 years later, our kids have the chance. I hope I answer your question. It's a very difficult one to answer, but what are those skills that you think we need to, we need to teach? If it's, we're moving away from knowledge, what are the key things? Value, believing, independent thinking, teamwork, care for others, these are the soft part. The knowledge may not teach you that. Mm. Folks, that's why I think we should teach our kids <coughs> on sports, entertain, uh, uh, the, the music, the painting, 
art. So making sure human should be different from everything we teach should be different from machine. If the machine can do better, you have to think about it. Okay. Hi, this is Hashem Al Musawi from Manamahab Bahrain. Talking about education and the fourth industrial revolution, we have been talking about people losing their jobs or they are not qualified enough with the skills needed. What are you doing for the people within your company to get up to date, to get continuous learning, to, get, uh, to know what the technology is needed for the future? Thank you. OK, luckily, I don't have to uh, do a lot of these kind of things in my company uh, because we are fighting every day for the future. We know if we do not work hard, Facebook, or Google, and Amazon, all these are going to do better. Right? So this is why we are globalized. It's, it's, a, it's a competition globalized. But we know that it's not, talk, it's not about technology competition. All the people today, not like uh, 18 founders, we only have uh, two and a half people are engineers. Today, we have more than 25,000 engineers. They are all smart people. They do much better job than the 18 years ago. But the only thing I want to <coughs> make sure that these people have a philanthropy heart. Because the data we have, the technology we have, if they do not have a great heart inside, we are going to make disaster for the world. Google, Facebook, Amazon, Alibaba, these companies, we are the luckiest company of this century. And we have the luck, if we are lucky, we have the responsibility that we should have a good heart to do something good. But on the other thing I want to say is about that making sure that everything you do is for the future. For example, you, you know about the single day? Single day shopping day. November 11 is the day we created. Last year, that day, we sold 25 billion US dollars for one day. And for the first minute, over 70 to 80 million people rush inside to shop on the mobile phone. So you have to make sure the system is good enough. We have to finish. We have to finish 270,000 transactions per second. Can you imagine that? <laughs> 270,000 <laughs> transactions per second. If we do not have that kind of uh, computing capability, the whole system will crash because we have several hundred million people waiting to pay the money. <laughs> so this technology, we know why we do this for crazy for one day, because we want to test the technology. This technology should be inclusive, because we know today in China, we create probably like 100 million package delivery. We believe a day. Five years later, the whole world would deliver 1 billion packages per day. Think about it. what's the technology. Are we ready for that? So the single day is to test this technology and, and to be inclusive. So making sure the market drive them, not the boss drive them. Thank you, Harry. Thank you, Jack. Uh, Jesus Cepeda from Mexico, from the Monterey Hub Global Shaper. Uh, we have been talking a lot about our generation, and I really like the conversation about three years before, three years after. Actually, I have been hearing these days that we haven't had this snow in 30 years here. So the question <laughs> is going to a quote uh, of Professor Schwab. He said a couple of months ago to the Global Shapers that we're the first gener generation that is going to suffer about climate change, and we are the last one that can do something about it. So with your teaching, pa teaching passion, what are the three things that you are saying to educate the 10 million employees or the 100 million employees or everyone who's looking at this video to develop an environmental mindset, a spiritual mindset, a non-fragmented world mindset? OK. <laughs> First, let me say this. Every disaster, the environment disasters, is a reflect of human heart today. Because when we need too much, we destroy a lot of things. I think the human being today, we, the past 200 years, 
because of knowledge-based technology or knowledge-based training system, all we want to do is get more. We want more things. We go to the moon, we go to Mars, we go this, we always outside looking. We human beings never inside looking. If you don't have the inside looking, you will never be wise. If you're not wise, you never know what you don't want. Today, human beings get much more than they expect they should have. So the environmental pollutions, the whole thing happening is because human beings become greedy, become arrogant. So this is why the big data, the data technology is trying to understand the inside of human. What is the data? It's the human behavior. A lot of people, trust me, the machine will know you better than you know yourself. Have you seen some movies, some gamblers? You know, they're, they're, they're great. They look at the eyes. You, if if he, he got a good card, this eyeball will shake. But normal people don't see it. The machine see all the details. Machine know you better. So what I would say is that in the data period, human be next to 100 years, people, human will know, try to understand, in, inward looking. We will see a lot of ugly, of ugly things of ourselves. When knowledge-based outward looking, you see the ugly things of the others and good things when you look inside working. This is Chinese philosophy. Chinese people, our believing is always inside working. We're supposed to do have inside checking every three, ti three times a day, but not, not really. If you can really do that, you can do that. Then you'll be good. So for environment, you're right. If we do not make action, take action. All the money you make will spend in the hospital, medicine. Our kids will be in big trouble. So let's fix it. And fix first, fix our heart, fix our know-how, and fix our belief. When you have a belief, when you have a religion, when you have a valley, it's better. So I think this is what I concerned me. This is what I think the young people should always have the value, the mission. If you have something you believe in your heart, then it would be different. This is what next 30 years education should be focused on. We have time for one last brief question. Karina? Thank you. This is Karuna from the Portless Hub Mauritius. And um, my question is, you talked about um, your workplace culture. I'd like to have one or two examples, if possible, of how do you motivate your employees? And I'd like to throw in a last question is, how much do you sleep? Because <laughs> this is such a controversial topic, and I keep hearing different versions. Thank you. What about keep the different versions? <laughs> Hours. Sorry, I've heard CEOs sleep only three to four hours, and whereas I've heard, like, you know, you need at least eight hours. Uh, so, yeah, I'm a bit divided, and, and <laughs> I'd love to know your secret. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. How do I motivate uh, incentive or motivate my, my uh, colleagues? You have to find the people that can mo mobilize themselves. It's impossible to, find, to, to encourage a negative person. So the people you hire, the people work together. They, they have to be. Or you cannot, we have 65,000 employees now. You cannot hire all of them that positive. But at least the people work with me. My management, leadership, several areas, they have to be positive. They have to know the, to, to incentive the others. Because I cannot incentive everybody. And making sure the culture so I think it would be very painful for me to talk to my vice president. And he need to be incentivized and mobilized every time. Right? This won't work. If he, is not, if he does not know how to incentivize or mobilize his people, it's better. I, I don't think he will be the vice president. He should be a good engineer, good designer, but not a good leader. A good leader should know 
help, but not by only money. Most of people incentivized or mobilized, not because you give them a lot of money. You give them respect, trust, appreciation, and correct, heartful advice. When you come to my meetings, internal meetings, you will be shocked because we, we are not like a lot of the other Chinese company. The boss say, everybody listen, take notes, and go down. We are like a war room. We make decisions based on whose voice is louder. <laughs> right? Early days, you know, we fight and we talk, and then making sure everybody speak up. Right. <clears throat> So this is also a way of mobilize an incentive. There are a lot of ways, and different people have a different way to send incentive. So this, how much time I sleep? Yeah, I have a problem. I mean, uh, I don't, I sleep uh, not, uh, not very short, but not good. And uh, I don't eat a lot. <laughs> this is something that I was, uh, Curious. Um, I don't eat a lot. I'm a very pickle on the food. And uh, I don't know, sometimes I would love to see what the things that make me work like that. But for sure, that if I suddenly give me one month vacation, I'll collapse. It's, I think there will be something in my heart, maybe the mission. At the beginning, it's a mission of 18 people. Today, we have 65,000 people. They all believe the mission. So if I give up, I can give up my position, but I should not give up the mission. If I give up, everybody say, hey, no. So, and then especially today, Alibaba at this size, people continue to say, for this size, the growth rate will be tiny or down. So what's the 10, 20 years Alibaba will look like? If you want to be, still be greater, or triple our size, what's what, what the direction? How to do it? So I spent a lot of time thinking. A lot of time thinking. And um, I love to think. Good thing is I have a good team now. I think, I do the talk, they do the work. <laughs> yes? On that note, I. I think, I'm sorry we didn't have a chance to take everyone's questions. We'll just have to make this an annual convening from now on. And I hope you can all join me in thanking Jack for his strong message of youth, inclusivity, particularly in the context of trade, and how we should all take time to look inside ourselves, cultivate our wiseness, because that's how we'll differentiate ourselves from machines. Thank you so much. Thank you.